Hello, Ed, and thank you very much for spending the time to talk to us today. Very welcome. Uh, so, Ed, then, fact or fiction, can bats get tangled up in your hair? I think it's extremely unlikely. It's always unwise to say something can't happen at all. But uh, many, many years ago, the people at, at uh, Nature and Servancy, it was then, tried. They, they got the frizziest haired secretary they could find uh, and a captive bat and actually tried to stick it in their hair. It didn't work at all. I think what very often happens <clears throat> is that you go out on a nice warm summer evening and, of course, there's a whole mass of insects attracted to your body heat so that just above your head there, there, there's a wonderful breakfast and the bats will fly in quite close to you but tangled in your hair no and even if they did it's far worse news for the bat than for you <laughs> okay how about the second um, uh, query people have in that um, do bats in this country carry rabies there is what's technically called bat lissa virus a rabies type virus that has been positively found in, I think, seven bats from this country out of over 5,000. So it is here, but at very low rates. <clears throat> um, if you ever have to handle a bat, then it's always sensible to wear gloves. You're not going to catch anything from them unless they bite you, and they're not going to bite you unless you've handling them. If you do get bitten by a bat and you really have got to be doing something pretty daft like bat work if you're going to be bitten by one, there is a post-exposure inoculation which will see you through perfectly safe. So it's not a problem. Right, okay. How about the third one then, that they suck your blood? In this country, no. Sadly, we don't have vampire bats. There are three species of vampire bat in the world, all living in Central and South America. Two quite rare and only drink the blood of birds. The other one, uh, Desmodus rotundus, the common, common vampire bat, is the one that takes mammal blood. Fascinating creature. They prefer livestock cattle, even donkeys, to human beings. Human beings, I think, something of a last resort. Um, I don't think our blood tastes as nice as that of cows. Um, but you've got to go to Central America for those. Um, amazing beasts. OK, so, well, now you know. You can go back watching with complete confidence. And um, speaking of watching bats, then, how many species of bat do we have in this country to look out for? There are certainly 17. People in Sussex would argue 18 because there is one greater mouse-eared bat that comes back to a hibernation site there each year. But I don't think one really counts as a population. 17 we have in, in, in reasonable numbers, some of them quite rare. Of those 17 species, we know we have 16 in Somerset and subject to some clever DNA analysis, which we're hoping will happen this summer, we may yet prove that we've got all of them. It's a brilliant county for bats. Uh, what are the most common ones we're most likely to see? There are two pipistrelle species which are, are hugely commoner than all the others put together, um, the common pipistrelle and the soprano pipistrelle. Uh, so much commoner than the others that people are rather apt to assume if they see a small bat flying around the house that it must be a pipistrelle. Um, well, quite likely it is, but it's not certain. I say we've got 16 species in Somerset. We've got two horseshoe species, greater horseshoe and the lesser horseshoe. And I, I make no bones about it, lesser horseshoes are the bats I fell in love with, so I mean, they, they are special. Mm. We've then got Noctule, Serotin, Common Pipistrelle, Soprano Pipistrelle, Nathusius Pipistrelle, Lysler's Bat, which we only discovered we'd got in the Taunton area um, a couple of years ago. We've been looking for it, we found it eventually. And then you've got Beckstein's Bat, Natura's Bat, Dorbenton's Bat, Whiskered Bat, Brandt's Bat, and the new one they found, Alcathoe's whiskered bat, and that's only been discovered as a British species in the last um, 12 months or so. So that's the one that we're looking for. How many have I got? Is that Oh, we've got the long-eared ones too, haven't we? We've got Barbastel, 
uh, brown long-eared and grey long-eared. Um, so yeah, we've got a fair old choice there. I'm sure I've left something out, but I can't think what it is. <laughs> plenty there anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> There's plenty to play with. So how long do bats live? Varies from species to species. We're talking about animals that range from the case of the pipistrelle species to a wingspan of about four inches in old money um, up to the noctules which have got over a foot's worth of wingspan. So we're talking about different sized animals. Pipistrelles in the wild will probably live about eight years, ten years if they're lucky. We had a captive one which admittedly never had to work for a living, we fed him. We had a captive one that died earlier this year at thirteen and a half, so um, they can live a while. The larger ones, they, we know there was a greater horseshoe in North Somerset which lived to 31. There are records in the United States of bats living to over 40. So they can live a long while. Well, it's not bad for a mammal, um, roughly the size of a, a mouse or a bit bigger, you can see how long mice live. Yeah, that's right. But of course they cheat. They spend half their life asleep. In terms, because there's this theory, isn't there, that, <clears throat> that, that every creature has a limited number of heartbeats, as it were, in its lifetime, and it's more or less constant. If your heart is barely beating half the year because you're in hibernation, then you can extend your life quite significantly. You think of the difference, different mammals think of, of a shrew, which is going all the time, mm -hmm. never stops and dies of old age at about 14 months if it's lucky and compare that with for example a dormouse which isn't a lot bigger and will live in the wild for five four or five years so you gain a lot by hibernating interesting yes mm. you do don't you yeah so then do they always roost in the same places um Again, it varies from species to species. The horseshoe bats seem to be extremely loyal to a given roost, summer roost, um, and to some extent to the hibernation sites as well. Um, I can think of one property which had lesser horseshoes in it, um, and had obviously had them for a long time, where the roof fell in and the house was virtually derelict and the bats were still clinging on in the tall chimneys that were left. So they, they, it takes a lot to persuade horseshoe bats to move. Conversely, some of the tree-dwelling species, things like noctules and barbastels, will move roost every other night almost, even when they've got um, young, they're suckling. So it varies hugely between species. Is there a reason why some bats choose a particular roosting place? I think if we knew that, we'd be able to do a great deal more in terms of conservation for them. You, yes, I mean, there are things you can predict. Um, mm. By and large, they're not stupid. They, they roost fairly near a good supply of food. They need a reasonably steady temperature, steady microclimate. Hot, downright hot in some cases, in the summer when they're breeding and cool in the winter. It's no accident that a lot of species tend to hibernate in underground sites and one of the reasons that Somerset is so good of course is that we've got all those lovely holes up in the Mendips for bats to, to, to spend the winter in. doesn't have to be particularly warm. Temperature of um, 8 degrees inside the cave would be fine but once you're in a cave or in a cellar or in a mine as soon as you're a few feet in from the entrance you get a good steady temperature regardless of what the weather's doing outside and that's perfect for hibernation. What's the average? Is it litter? Um, well it's not a litter because bizarrely um, bats tend to only have one baby at a time. Twins are really quite rare and probably quite bad news for mother actually but usually they have just one baby which again is exactly the opposite of what you'd expect. Most small mammals, you can say the smaller a mammal is, the more litters it has in a year, the more babies it has in a litter. Now, not with bats, one at a time. And a lot of species won't actually give birth every year. All um, right. Greater horseshoes, uh, every other year at best, and the females aren't sexually mature until they're four. 
So they need to live a long time. Yes. Simply to keep the population numbers steady, let alone increasing. And of course, again, from a conservation point of view, it's a lousy technique because if you do get a violent decline in numbers, a roost destroyed or whatever, it's going to take years and years and years to build them back up again. Hmm. How do they stay with the parents? Um, they are beginning to fly at about three weeks. They are weaned and theoretically at least entirely self-sufficient at about five weeks. But they are big when they're born. It's only one baby, but it's a big baby. Um, a <clears throat> Typically a quarter of mother's body weight, lesser horseshoes, babies can be anything up to a third of mother's body weight. That's heavy, isn't it, for a baby? I mean, well, particularly if you're out flying, catching insects the night before you give birth, it's a lot of cargo to carry around. <laughs> what is it bats actually feed on? All our European species live on insects. Um, our British species, all on insects, uh, different insects, obviously. Pipistrels eat a lot of tiny little midges and uh, um, micro moths, things like that. Uh, greater horseshoes are famously keen on large yellow underwing moths and for about a fortnight cockchafers, you know the maybugs. And there was one study of droppings done some years ago which found in a good cockchafer area uh, that during the fortnight that they were on the wing uh, they made up 85% of the bats diets. That's a lot, isn't it? 85%. But isn't it a nice cheap meal? You know, there's a lot of meat in there and they fly very badly and you can catch them quite easily. Um, but they're opportunist feeders. If there's a good source of food, they will switch to it. They're not, they're not obliged to eat particular species. And uh, it's quite interesting to see and a lot of work's being done on analysing droppings quite interesting to see these switches they make as things come out of season into season. The other marvellous food for them um, throughout the time that they're awake and even when they wake up from time to time in the winter to feed of course is crane flies. Uh, but there are species of crane fly that are about virtually every month of the year. So nice food source that one. So how much do they consume in a night? Um, oh, there's various estimates. Again, it probably varies on in between individuals, but mm. the, the figure that's always quoted is that a single common pipistrelle on a good night mm. can demolish anything up to 3,000 small insects. Uh, can bats be used as an indication of the state of the environment? Certainly, they're very good indicator species. Um, if you don't have the insects there, you won't have the bats there. Mm. The insects, in turn, demonstrate a healthy uh, vegetative um, environment. Uh, you know and I know that if you get a, a, a chemically treated monoculture of oilseed rape, it's got no insects in it. Um, worth speaking of, it's got no bats flying over it. Mm. Because they are reasonably adaptive in terms of what they eat and highly mobile, they will of course go where the food is. Yeah. And that will tell you where the ecosystem is working nicely. No, they're, they're excellent indicators. Uh, well, we'll take a break now, Ed, um, some music, and you've got something a bit different, haven't you, for us to listen to. Tell us a bit about the music you've chosen. Right. Well, um, Splendid Man called David King, who makes a lot of the bat detectors that people use, decided to use the sounds you hear on a bat detector um, to try and make music out of them. And you get two sort of noises out of a, a, a normal bat detector. Uh, one is a series of clicks, um, sort of noise which can be used as percussion but the other is that the, the horseshoe bats do a sort of warble sort of noise and you can use that to produce notes so what David managed to do was to synthesize these into music and we, what we've got here is music sung by bats let's have a listen to this <laughs> Thank you. 
That was David King and his greater horseshoe bat ensemble playing the waltz from De Fledermaus by Johann Strauss. Now, Ed, could you possibly give us uh, a typical year in the life of a bat? Right. Well, we'll begin, I think, towards the end of April when you wake up. Um, you've been in hibernation during the winter. You're assuming you're a female. You are then going to aim to give birth at the end of June, beginning of July. Okay. So you've got a lot of feeding to do. A good, warm, insect-rich spring is going to be nice for you. You're going to build up your body weight, mm -hmm. um, help the fetus, and so on. You give birth, I say, usually beginning of July. Baby then is weaned after five weeks, uh, getting nicely into August then. And that, late August, September time through into October, is when most of the mating activity takes place. Now that's weird, isn't it? Um, yes. Small animal um, <clears throat> mating in August and giving birth the next July sounds like a very long gestation period. That's for small mammal. It isn't. They do a very bizarre trick. They do a sperm storage. Clever. A lot of mammals will do a delayed implantation. So you only know, think of badgers and roe deer and stoats and things like that, where the, the egg is fertilised but doesn't implant into the wall of the womb. There's one European bat species does that, but we don't have that one. It's a thing called Schreiber's bat. All our bats mate, store the male sperm in the female body all through the winter, through hibernation. Come the spring, when we woke up in late April, you remember, ovulates, that egg is fertilised from the stored sperm and the baby is then born in the height of summer when there's lots of insects about. Absolutely fascinating. It's, it's an extraordinary, no other mammals that I know of do it. So, lot of mating then going on at the end of the summer. There is a little bit of mating happens in the spring, but mostly it's the end of the summer. Uh, then as the nights get colder, fewer insects about, you look for somewhere to spend the winter move into the hibernation sites in this part of the world, usually um, mid-November or thereabouts, um, but it's warm and, and, and wet down in this part of the world, so they don't necessarily go into hibernation sites, all of them. A lot of them will hang on in, in, in um, above ground roosts or, or, or even in the, in the maternity roost, um, because there's no need to if the temperature's above nine ten degrees mm. they, 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 they can exist very happily without having to go underground um, during hibernation they arouse wake up more or less every ten nights or so and scratch and fidget and urinate and make sure everything's still working and mm. if it's warm enough go up and find out and see if there's anything to eat if it's not just go back to sleep again so that takes you through merrily doing singularly little really from mid-November until the towards the end of April when you wake up again and uh, not having seen a fella since August you whoops find you pregnant. Um, interesting life. No wonder they live so long. Mm. But the other thing they do is that quite apart from hibernation in the, the summer if they're not doing anything when they go to sleep they go into torpor. They don't just go to sleep, they let their body temperature drop down and their heartbeat slow down and so on. So it's quite possible to find a perfectly healthy sleeping bat in the middle of summer with a body temperature of no more than about five or six degrees. That's low, isn't it? Yeah. If you find a, a, a sleeping bat, you have to let it warm up. You have to hold it in your hand for a anything up to a quarter of an hour for it to be booted up enough to get going again. Um, and then its normal flying temperature will be nearly 40 degrees. By doing this voluntary um, heterothermy is the technical term, but allowing your, 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 your body temperature to go down to close to the ambient temperature, you save a heck of a lot of energy. Is it possible, Ed, to garden with bats in mind? Um, obvious, I know, but the thing to do is to encourage the insects. Yeah. So don't spray things. 
uh, grow flowers that um, bloom at night things like evening primroses night scented stock um, tobacco flowers things like that which are moth pollinated and those will bring in lots of night flying insects a nice garden pond not too clean a bit of muck in a pond a bit of weed a bit of uh, something which the insects can hatch from yeah yeah that's that's got to be good and trees and shrubs and bushes um not just because they like to hang up during the night and digest their food in them but also because those will then produce little pockets of still air even on a windy night and that you know and i know and anybody knows is where the gnats and the midges collect so mm. there you are you mentioned hanging upside down just a thought that a lot of people might want to know why do bats hang upside down oh yes um a lot of reasons it gives you a very good getaway um if you want to start flying all you've got to do is let go with your feet drop down and you've got airspeed straight away Grab it, yeah. so you don't need to kick off but another thing is in the bone structure a bat's pelvis if you look at a bat skeleton is very light barely fused a, a, a really looks a very insubstantial bit of bone mm -hmm. it's probably too insubstantial to bear their weight if they tried standing on their hind legs um, but of course it, that's fine because it can take the stretch mm -hmm. yeah um, it just can't take the impact uh, of standing up on your legs now what do people need to be aware of if they have bats roosting in their property right it's a criminal offense to kill injure maim or disturb any of our native bats right but if you do have a problem with them before you do anything which might disturb them you have to contact the authorities uh, it's a, an enterprise called bat line telephone line which is run by the bat conservation trust for natural england and they will tell you what you can and can't do they will tell you what you should do uh, and they will put you in touch with somebody like me and my bat group colleagues uh, who come out as licensed roost visitors to mm -hmm. assess the problem so there's that level of protection um, so they're not a huge problem to have uh, I know lots of people who are delighted to have their bats up there and uh, beg me to come and look at them and make sure they're all right I'd be one of them and sit in the garden perfect situation is sit, sit in your nice insect rich garden in a deck chair a glass of wine in your hand at dusk and watch the bats pouring out of your leaves yeah. what could be nice and now they won't get tangled up in your hair no no they won't <laughs> Ed Wells, thank you very much for coming over and talking to us. It's been fascinating, it really has. Thank you very much. Not at all. <laughs>